Well, good morning. I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John 10, verse 1, you can find it on page 842 if you're using one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you. This morning we're moving into a new chapter. This is our study of uh, this book called Behold Your God, John's great, great theme. Here is Jesus, He is God of very God, Behold Your God. Now, as we move, though, from chapter 9 to chapter 10, a lot of times in our minds we, we uh, have hard lines in our chapters when, when we think it through. So if there's a chapter change, it must be a complete change in everything. But as I've told you uh, before, just because the chapter changes doesn't mean that the topic changes. The chapters, the verses were added later by scholars. They're not inspired by God. Uh, scholars later added them so that we'd be able to search through the Scriptures, and I'm, I'm very thankful for it, because this morning I say to you, open to John chapter 1, or John chapter 10, verse 1, and you all open to the same spot in your Bible that I open in mine. So I'm grateful that it's there. It helps us to search through. The, the, the downside to them is that because of our Western thinking when we, and our modern thinking, when we close one chapter and move to the new chapter, we assume we're moving to a new topic, that we're completely changing subject. But that's not always the case, as is here. We're moving from chapter 9 into chapter 10, but we're not leaving the blind beggar behind. In fact, we're still in the same conversation that was uh, going on prior uh, to chapter 10 here, what was going on at the end of chapter 9. John writes in a th- more of a thematic way than a chronological way anyhow. So when we come into these final 20 or, or these first 21 verses here of John chapter 10, um, the, the chronology of how it fits in may not be exact and precise. Uh, the other gospels, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, they write chronologically. They start at the beginning with Jesus and they move through to his resurrection and everything is ordered on a time frame, much the way you would write a biography. But John writes more in a thematic aspect. He's trying to show us the big theme. Jesus is God of very God. So when he starts, he goes to the beginning, but he goes all the way back to the very beginning before the foundation of the world and starts showing us that Jesus is God and moves forward. But his his timeline is a little more fluid and harder to follow. These 21 verses here that we find at the opening of John chapter 10 are either taking place at the exact same time as the healing of the blind man, or it is taking place at a short time later. But I would say that these 21 verses are taking place at the exact same time as the closing verses of John chapter 9. That closing conversation that took place between Jesus and the blind man. Now, just to refresh you, or in case you haven't been with us, update you. Uh, Jesus has, uh, has healed a man on the Sabbath day. He and his disciples came by. They found this man who had been born blind, and Jesus stopped on the Sabbath to heal him and to give him eyes. Now, it wasn't just to give him eyes, but there was some uh, in- intentionality in this story, in this account. One of it was to correct some erroneous theology, The disciples expressed the theology of the day that there was a problem with this man. The reason he was born blind must have been because of someone's sin. Either it was the sin of the parents, uh, that they sinned in some way and therefore God was punishing the child as a result, or it was the sin of this man in 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 the womb, a prenatal sin before he was even born, and that somehow he had done something against God in the womb and therefore was born in this state. Jesus corrects this erroneous theology and explains to them it's not because of sin that he was born with a birth defect, but it is so that the works of God would be on display, so that the glory of God would be revealed. He then heals the man by mixing his own saliva with mud, kneading it together, uh, sorry, with dirt, kneading it together to make a mud, and then he places it on his eyes. From there, the man went to the pool of Siloam, which means sent, just as he was instructed. He washed and he came back seeing. When he arrives back, Jesus is gone, but those neighbors and friends who were in the area receive him back, and there arises a great dispute among them as to whether or not this is the same man. He keeps repeating that he is. Finally, they agree that he is. 
They ask him how he has gained his sight. He explains it to them, and they are troubled because this means Jesus healed on the Sabbath. It's a violation of, of at least three of the Pharisaical laws, so they brought him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees also uh, uh, interrogate the blind man, not believing initially that he was born blind until his parents come and testify that in fact it is the same man. Finally, they acknowledge that he has been healed and they want to know how. And so he again tells them the exact same account of how Jesus on the Sabbath had kneaded his saliva and dust together to form a mud and placed it on his eyes and sent him to the pool and he washed and he came back seeing. But as they hear this story, they become enraged and they challenge him to give glory to God and to call Jesus a sinner. Now the blind man is astonished by this. He is astonished by their claims and their inability to see who it is that Jesus was. These religious leaders were the ones to be on the lookout for the Messiah. They they were the ones who knew the Scriptures the best. They were the teachers they should have known. He is amazed at their inability to see what is so plainly obvious before all. That Jesus is God of very God. That He is the one sent from God. So he asks them if they also wanted to become disciples of Jesus. Their response was to kick Him out of the synagogue. The final conversation that takes place in chapter 9 is between Jesus and the now seeing beggar, in which Jesus asks him if he believes in the Son of Man. At that point, he professes his belief, he falls down, and he worships Jesus. And it's no small thing that Jesus receives his worship. No, No prophet would have ever received the worship of a man. If other men fell down before a prophet and began worshiping, saying, oh, you are a god or like the gods, they would have made them stop. No apostle would have received the worship of men. In fact, when Paul and Silas were were teaching and the, the men fell down before them and said, oh, you are of the gods, and they said, no, stop, we are men like you. But here we find this blind, now seeing beggar, understanding who the Son of Man is. And he falls down and worships. And Jesus receives his worship. He receives the worship of the man because Jesus is, in fact, God, a very God, the God he claims to be. The conversation that's going on at the end of chapter 9 is not a private conversation. There were others who were gathered around, there were religious leaders as well as townspeople. And as this man is worshiping Jesus, Jesus pronounces judgment on those who claim to see but are truly blind. When the Pharisees ask if He is speaking about them, Jesus responds by telling them that their guilt remains. And this is where our text picks up. They want to know, are you speaking about us? And Jesus is saying, yes. And because you insist on the fact that you see when you really don't see, your guilt remains. See, when we when we refuse to admit that we in fact are blind, but that we can see, we'll never receive the help that we need. And so our guilt remains, which is exactly where they were at. Well, this is where our text picks up this morning, the continuation of this conversation that is going on and the teaching again of our Lord. So won't you stand with me as I read the the Word of God? I'm going to read verses 1-21 through this morning. However... We'll likely only cover the first ten like we did in the first service, so stand with me and follow along as I read. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. 
thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. Of my own accord, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews. Because of these words, many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Father, we come this morning and ask for clarity that we would not be blind, but that You would give us eyes to see and that we would see the text. We pray that You would give us ears, that we would hear Your voice, that we would hear the voice of the shepherd, and that, Father, You would give us faith to believe and to be obedient to You. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Pharisees were not real fond of the illustration that Jesus was using when He had spoken to them at the end of John chapter 9 and was using this illustration of sight and and blindness. They didn't like the illustration that He is using. And so, they seem to be mocking Him. They seem to be mocking Jesus in their question about His pronounced judgment. So you're saying there is sight, some seeing and the seeing are going to be blind and the blind are going to see. What are you saying? Are we also blind? Because there was an assumption amongst the religious leaders that they could not be blind. Others may be blind, but we would not be blind. We would clearly see. Others may not understand. Others may be led astray easily, but not us. We're the religious leaders. We will not be taken in because we see clearly. The blind man, well, now he needed to be healed because he couldn't see. He needed to be forgiven because he clearly had sinned. So when they asked if they were also blind, there is a tone of sarcasm because they did not believe that they could ever be blind. But Jesus then tells them plainly that in fact their guilt remains. Because you are blind, but you say you see your guilt remains. Until you admit that you are blind and you confess and you repent, you will have your guilt remaining on you. He then continues on, but he changes the illustration as we enter into chapter 10. He continues the conversation, continues speaking to the same group of people, but now he uses a figure of speech that exposed these Pharisees as the thieves and the robbers that they are. The Pharisees rose as a political and a religious group somewhere around 150 B.C. They rose to power. They began leading. They were, the, uh, they, they were really the, the uh, blue-collar leaders. They were not the white-collar leaders. They were the, the, the average man who had rose into authority and power and teaching. But by the time Jesus had come, they certainly didn't act that way. They certainly saw themselves as better than the average man. They took on the role of leading and teaching the people of God. And the illustration that Jesus is giving here is a particularly stinging one for them. Because what it does is it serves as the evidence of their guilt. The unasked question at the end of chapter 9 is, what guilt? What guilt? When you say their guilt remains, what guilt is Jesus talking about? Well, the the proper response to finding out that the Son of God is here is to fall down and worship Him. Just as the blind, now seeing beggar does. He finds out that Jesus is the Son of Man, meaning that He is the revelation of God to man, and He responds by falling down and worshiping Him. 
That's the correct response. When you don't see Jesus for who He is and you don't fall down and worship Him, then your guilt remains. Their guilt remained because they did not recognize who Jesus was. They did not worship Him as God of very God. When we see Him for who He is, we will worship Him. That is the goal of the Father. The Father has sent the Son to seek worshipers, true worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Yet these Pharisees have rejected Him. They rejected His work. They rejected His Word. Jesus told them their guilt remained, but they likely believed themselves still to be guiltless. The illustration that Jesus gives here in the opening uh, verses of chapter 10 nails these religious leaders as the thieves and the robbers that they are. When He begins this illustration, He introduces us to two contrasting characters. The shepherd and the strangers. The strangers come, they are the thieves, they are the robbers that we find in the first five verses here. Truly, truly, I say to you, in verse 1, he who does not enter by the sheepfold, or doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, this man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door, enters by the door, is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, to understand the illustration a little more fully, we need to understand a little bit more about the sheep industry in the ancient Middle East. See, our modern American sheep farms are generally large, and they're also generally autonomous, meaning that they function themselves. They usually have a large number of sheep, a lot of acreage, especially if you go out to the western part of our, our nation, enormous amount of sheep in one farm. But even here in the smaller farms, we still have quite a few sheep, and they still run relatively autonomous, meaning that they keep their flocks separate from other flocks. We don't have a communal gathering of the flock. Uh, even if you were to go to a sheep show at a county fair, you'll find that the various shepherds will keep their sheep separated from the rest of the sheep. It's for health reasons. They don't want interacting and they don't want to pass sickness or disease on from one flock to the next. That's how we function today. But that is not how the farmers, or the, the shepherds functioned in the ancient world. The shepherds in ancient time needed to protect their sheep 24 hours a day. And so what, it was, what they would do was they would bring them at night to a common sheepfold. This would be an area outside of the temple. It would be, or sorry, outside of the city. It would be walled in. And there would be a door, one door, one gate, if you will, to enter in. And they would have a gatekeeper that was there. The walls would be anywhere from six to eight feet high to keep the sheep safe and to keep predators and criminals out. So they would all bring their sheep to this one sheepfold and they would hire a gatekeeper to sit by the door. And they would come and deliver their sheep. And the next shepherd would come and deliver his sheep. And all the sheep would enter into the fold. And once they were in the fold, they were free to roam and mix with sheep from other flocks. They were also protected by the walls from the dangers that were outside. In the morning, the shepherd would return to the sheepfold, and he would enter through the gate, and he would retrieve his sheep. There was no reason for the shepherd to climb over the wall, because he had every legal right to go through the gate. And the gatekeeper would recognize the shepherd and allow the shepherd to come in. But, there are those of a nefarious nature who would want to come to the fold with the intent of stealing the sheep. And when they would come, they wouldn't come to the gate. Because if you're not one of the shepherds, then the gatekeeper wasn't going to let you in to the sheepfold. So what they would do is try to slip over the wall in the dark hours, and steal the sheep away. Now, sheep are not the smartest of animals. They're flighty. They're skittish. They're dumb. They're nervous. But one thing sheep do well is they listen to the voice of their shepherd. And they don't listen to strange voices. Verse 3, it says, to him, that is the shepherd, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So in the morning when the shepherd comes, the, the gatekeeper opens it up, and he calls to his sheep. And at the sound of his voice, his sheep, which are all intermixed with the other sheep, begin to come out. They begin to file out, and they come to the voice of the shepherd. And as they come out, 
he then leads them. Now, anybody that knows me remotely at all understands that I am not a farmer. I don't enjoy farming. I don't like the muck. I don't like the dirt. I just, it's not my thing. But I have learned a number of things over the years living in area around farmers and being married to the farmer's daughter and having children who really do enjoy farming. I've learned quite a bit over the years. And my privilege had the, my, my children have the privilege of working on a sheep farm growing up. They work for uh, John and Pat Clark on their farm for a number of years and helped out with their sheep flock. I would often come over to pick up the kids or drop the kids off for work at the barn and I would see them interacting and working with the sheep and see the response between them and the sheep. And knowing that there is some scriptural context to sheep, I would try to pay a little bit of attention and, and see how it is that they really responded and what do they really do. What I observed uh, was 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 pretty incredible. I observed both John and Pat Clark, they cared for their sheep. Uh, I, I was blessed to see the, uh, the trust of the sheep on display before their shepherds, to see the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, and how they loved and nurtured and cared for their sheep. I also had the opportunity to see my children interact with the sheep as they cared for them and watch the sheep respond to my children who they had gotten to know and learned their voices. One afternoon I had gone with Caitlin over to do chores and I don't remember exactly why, but she had gone into the barn to get ready, whatever, and I was probably in a hurry to get somewhere, so wanted to help along and I knew the sheep needed to come in and I could see them in the pasture. So while she's in the barn collecting her stuff, I would go to the edge, I went to the edge of the fence because I'm not about to step in, because that could be dangerous. So I got to the edge of the fence, and I decided I would holler out to the sheep and see if I could get the sheep to come in, because that might speed the process along. And so I hollered out to him to come. In fact, I think Caitlin told me what I was supposed to say. So I said whatever I was supposed to say to get the sheep to come, and what stunned me was that not only did they not respond to me, they didn't even act as though they heard me. Their heads were buried in the grass, and they didn't raise their heads at all. So I hollered a little louder and still got no response. And about that time, Caitlin came out and said something. Not at a loud volume, but she said something and their heads popped up out of the grass. And then she called them and they came running right to her. And I was amazed at this. The sheep knew the voice of the shepherd and they came. They didn't know the voice of the stranger. And they weren't coming to my voice. The sheep know the shepherd. How do they identify their shepherd? It wasn't by looking, it was by listening. They hear the voice. Sheep always hear the voice of their shepherd. Perhaps this is why the blind man responded to the voice of Jesus. At the end of John 9, as they're having this conversation and he is asking Jesus, or Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he's saying, who is the Son of Man that I might believe in him? And Jesus says to him in 9.37, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And the blind beggar who is now seeing said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He responded to the voice of the shepherd. He responded in obedience to the voice of the shepherd at the beginning of the chapter when the miracle occurred and Jesus said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He obeyed the voice. He recognized it and he responded. Now here is an interesting note of intimacy between the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd calls his sheep by name. This is not a commercial thing. You know, some of the larger commercial farming industries are just so big that put a number tag on the ear and they go into the flock and they don't know which one is which. It's just number 864259. And they'll bring them out and they can go to the record books and look to see what their genetics or their breeding are, but they don't really pay much attention to them because it's just such an enormous farm. There are so many. But that's not the image or the picture that is here. Here the shepherd knows the sheep and he knows them by name. Every one of them is given a name and the shepherd never forgets it. All the sheep on the Clark's farm were given names. Some of the names were silly. Some of the names were there to honor people. And some of the names were just simply descriptive of their actions. I remember one ram who was named Nimrod. He liked to run into poles or walls or anything else. 
it was a, an appropriate and, and fitting name for him. Now, I couldn't tell you the names of most of the sheep, and if I were to look out at them, I, they were just white. That's what I would notice. I could tell the difference in the breed, but I didn't know which sheep was which sheep for the most part. But the shepherds knew. My children knew. John and Pat Clark knew. They cared for the sheep. They remembered their names. They knew them by name. Some of the most remarkable and tender moments that I have witnessed were between the shepherd and the sheep. I've watched John and Pat Clark care for their sheep with nurture and with love. They knew the sheep and the sheep knew them. On one occasion, at least one occasion, I know of a lamb that was orphaned by its mother, kicked out. To save the lamb, you then have to bottle feed them, and because they were so small the, and not, not responding and not thriving, the Clarks took this little lamb into their home and nurtured the little lamb in their home for quite some time. That little lamb never forgot the care that it received from the shepherd, and from that point on, didn't really act like a lamb or livestock, but acted more like a child or a pet. <laughs> They would come out and they would call the name and the lamb would come running and it would follow them around the barn and it would, it would go wherever they went. It would follow them back in the house if they would allow it. It never forgot the care and the nurture of the shepherd. I also remember watching the tender last moments of a dying ewe while her shepherd was there caring for her, knowing her and calling her by name. The shepherd knows his sheep. The shepherd loves his sheep. The shepherd cares for his sheep. And the sheep know their shepherd. As the illustration continues, Jesus says in in verse 5, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. When the stranger would ascend the wall because he can't go through the gate, his goal was to steal the sheep. But if he were just to ascend from the wall and try to call to the sheep, they wouldn't come to him. In fact, they would run to the other side of the pen. They would scurry away. They would probably make noise. And he would be discovered. So to keep the sheep from making noise because they they wouldn't follow him, uh, he, he would do other things to try and steal the sheep. Because the sheep don't follow the stranger. They follow the shepherd. The point of the illustration is that Jesus is the shepherd and the sheep will follow Him. The reason that the blind man worshipped Him was because he heard the voice of the shepherd and he followed Him. The reason that the crowd did not was because they were not sheep. See, sheep will always follow the shepherd. But if they're not sheep, then they don't follow the shepherd. The point of the illustration is that the sheep only follow the shepherd. The reason they didn't joyfully follow the Pharisees was because the Pharisees were thieves and robbers. They were the strangers that are described in this passage. Well, as verse 6 tells us, they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Here you have the Pharisees. Here you have the crowd gathered around. Jesus gives this elaborate illustration, and they don't get it. They didn't understand his figure of speech. So he then continues on, but he tweaks his illustration just a bit. And he introduces us to another character. And this character is the door, or the Savior, in verses 7-10. through It says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We're now introduced to this new character, the door here, the means of salvation. It is the third of the seven major I am statements in the Gospel of John. Remember, When Jesus is saying, I am, He is making a claim to be the one true eternal God. And He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door through which salvation comes. There is no subtlety here. He is making His claim to be the eternal self-existent God. 
I am the door. This again is a biting illustration. It's a, it's a bite that can sting with the pain of death if you reject it. What Jesus is saying is that there is only one way to enter into the safety of the sheepfold, and that is through the door. Notice He doesn't say, I am a door. But He says, I am the door. There are not multiple doors that go into the sheepfold. There is one door door. One way of salvation. And that is what Jesus is saying. He is the only way of salvation. That means the, all the other religions and all the other beliefs, they are wrong. And they're not going to get you to safety. So if they're calling you and saying, follow me through this door, they're not leading you into safety, but rather they're leading you to the slaughterhouse. There's only one door that leads to the fold, and that door is Jesus. So Islam, Buddhism, naturalism, humanism, paganism, and any other isms, any belief that is not Jesus does not lead to eternal life. It means that the way of God alone is the way of salvation. For the Father is the gatekeeper and the Son is the gate. Jesus says, I am the door. And in this whole elaborate illustration, There is a gatekeeper here. And the gatekeeper is the Father. The Father is the one who recognizes the shepherd coming and opens the door for him. The Father is the one who opens the door and lets the sheep go in and out. But the door itself is Jesus Christ. The Father is the gatekeeper. The Son is the gate. The Father allows the sheep to travel through the gate. But you must come through that gate alone, that door alone, which is Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were not willing to follow Jesus Christ. They were not willing to recognize Him as the Messiah, the One sent from God, the Son of Man. They were not willing to see Him in that light. They were not willing to recognize Him as the only door in. They were not willing to follow the, the law of God alone. Remember, one of the key aspects of being a Pharisee was that you added to the law. They were big proponents of interpreting the law in light of their current situation and needs. And so they often added to the laws of God. It was God's law plus their laws. This is why they were so upset with Jesus. It wasn't that Jesus violated God's law of the Sabbath, but Jesus violated the Pharisaical laws of the Sabbath. It was God's law plus their law. Now please understand, if you were to enter into the sheepfold, It can't be through a door that says Jesus plus. One of the great problems that we had in ministering in Africa was clarifying that the way of eternal life was Jesus alone. The culture of many Africans was to add Jesus to the mantle of their other saviors. So they might believe in Jesus, but they would also believe in naturalism. They would also believe in ancestors. They would... They would also believe in and whatever else it was that had come along and said this is the way, they would simply add it to their mantle of belief. And one of our great struggles was to come in and say, no, you can't do that with Jesus. You have to clear the mantle of everything because it is Jesus alone, not Jesus plus. He alone is the Savior. He alone is the door. And that's what he's pointing out. I am the door. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Here's the joy of entering through the door. Jesus says, anyone who enters through him will be saved. Now, if you try to enter by any other means, then you are a thief and a robber. And any who say you can get there by any other means is a thief and a robber. And they are trying to steal what God is protecting. Jesus gives a promise. If you enter by Him, you will be saved and you will go in and out and find pasture. There was safety for those sheep who were blessed and protected in the sheepfold. Now understand the going in and out and finding pasture here. This is not going into the kingdom and then somehow coming out of the kingdom. This is the idea of being under the protection, guard, and care of the shepherd. And you go through the door 
Both ways and you find safety. When it's daytime, you come through the door and into the pasture with the shepherd and you're under his care and protection and you find the goodness and the riches of the pasture. And when you go through the door in the night hours, you find the protection under of the sheep fold itself. Going through the door was the means of salvation. And there was safety for those sheep who were blessed and protected in the sheepfold. Jesus is promising that through Him we will find the life that we are seeking. Now, there is a warning and there is a blessing that follow this illustration. The warning is regarding those who are thieves, the ones who have come before Jesus, the ones who say that there is another way or another door. He says that they are coming for the purpose of stealing and killing and destroying. See, the thief would come at night and his intent was to steal the sheep. He wouldn't enter by the gate because the gatekeeper doesn't allow it, so he slips over the wall at night. He can't lure the sheep away. First, he can't lure them out through the gate because the gatekeeper won't allow it. He can't lure them because they won't respond to his voice and they won't follow him. He can't get them over the wall. And in order to keep them silent, he would often slit their throats and then he would cast their carcass over the wall. From there, he would use the wool and he would eat the meat because he cared nothing for the sheep. He only used them for what gain they brought him. And he brought death to the flock. This is a stern warning to those who come along and steal the sheep away. Jesus says, through Him there is life. Through them there is death. Through Jesus there is life. Not just life, but there is an abundant life. Now, this is the blessing, and with this blessing, though, I have to often also caution us. We, we have often come to this verse and had it misquoted, misused, misappropriated. In fact, it has been abused so much that we tend to think of it in terms of monetary gain or earthly treasures and possessions. There are many, many thieves and robbers who have stood in the pulpits of churches and claimed that the abundant life that Jesus wants you and I to have, the abundant life that He is giving, is a life filled with an abundance of trinkets, of money, of stuff, of possessions, of lands. In other words, what they'll say is that you get Jesus for the future after you die. In this life, the abundant life is to get stuff for today. They would say that if you really have faith, then your possessions will match the faith that you have. So if you have a lot of faith, you're going to have a lot of possessions. And if you don't have a lot of possessions, then it's because you simply don't have enough faith. But is this the abundant life that God is calling us to? Are material possessions the abundant life that Jesus is referring to? If that's the case, then why do people need Jesus? And the reason I ask that is because to acquire that kind of abundance, you can do it without Jesus. You don't need Jesus to become wealthy. You don't need Jesus to become successful in the eyes of the world. Just look at Wall Street. Look at Hollywood. Look at the sporting world. There are millions of people who have millions and millions of dollars. They have every trinket, everything that you can imagine or ever want. And they do it without Jesus. They have no regard for Him. And they collect stuff. So if the collecting of stuff, and if that is the abundant life that Jesus is talking about, then why do we need Jesus at all? Because you can gain all of that without having Jesus. It's because that's not the abundant life that Jesus is talking about. He is not promising us an abundance of earthly possessions. In fact, the whole of Scriptures teaches us quite the contrary. The abundant life that Jesus is providing for us is something that the world cannot know. It's something the world cannot obtain, which is why there are so many out there who have the abundance of wealth and possessions and are empty and have nothing. Because they don't have the abundant life that the shepherd is offering. He is promising us an abundant life that brings hope, joy, peace, love, strength. That's what comes through the shepherd. To be loved by the shepherd. 
to have the hope of life, the joy in life, peace that satisfies and strength to endure. This is the deep longing of our hearts and it is provided through Christ alone. You cannot obtain it without Him. It's not something that is reserved for the future either. We often look at it and we say, oh, well, one day when Christ returns, we'll have that abundant life. One day when He returns, we'll know peace, we'll know joy, but now we just have to endure through it. Now, Jesus is promising His sheep the abundant life now. It begins now. And that abundance is love and hope and joy and peace and strength. When you enter through the door, it is yours. The good life. The good life is not measured by possessions. It is measured by contentment. And the only true contentment comes through Jesus. In Him there is no worry. In Him there is no fear. You know, one of the great killers of sheep is worry. I've talked about this before. There is such a thing called sheep worry where the sheep get so fearful so worried in a condition, in, in a situation that they will simply die from fear. When you enter through the door of Jesus, you enter into rest and safety, and you go in and out under the protection and the care of the shepherd. There is hope that the shepherd will protect and guide and order your steps. There's the love and care and nurture and feeding of the shepherd. There is a joy that comes for the one who has been saved. Oh, what joy to have your guilt removed. Your sins removed. This was, this was something the Pharisees didn't understand. It's why Jesus says your guilt remains. They had no idea what joy was. What peace comes when we realize peace has been made with the Father so that there is no more condemnation that rests upon us. There is no more enmity between God and us. There is strength that is brought to us by the power of the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. It enables us to face the trials of this life and know that eternity is coming. We're able to endure the struggles and the hardships of this world and this life and this suffering because we're under the care of the shepherd. And we are strengthened by Him. Jesus follows up this statement about the good life by returning to the shepherd illustration and telling us that He is the good shepherd. That's how verse 11 begins. I am the good shepherd. It is the fourth of the I am statements. We'll spend a good deal more time on that next week. But it is through the Good Shepherd that the good life comes. You really want an abundant life? You want the love and the hope and the peace and the joy and the strength that comes through Christ alone and through the Shepherd? And you have to go through the door because from the Good Shepherd, through the door comes the good life. So then the question that raises in our minds is, okay, that's what I want. How do I then enter the sheepfold? And the answer is, you go through the door. How do I come under the care of the shepherd? The answer is, you hear his voice. You follow the example of the blind beggar. He obeyed the voice of the shepherd. And then he saw. And then he heard. And then he believed. And then he worshipped. Jesus instructed him when He healed him in John 9, 7, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And He went and He washed and He came back seeing. And what do we find in that? We find obedience. Obedience to do what the voice of the Good Shepherd had instructed him. He heard the voice and He obeyed. This is the beauty of, of how the Spirit of God works and transforms us. This is the beauty of how you enter through the door. The voice calls and commands, and you obey. He said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And without hesitation, the blind man goes and washes. And he comes back, and he now has eyes that see. But as he is being interrogated by the Pharisees, it's at some point in that conversation is when spiritually, his spiritual eyes are opened, and he really begins to see. 
as it was all laid out before Him, the only one who can heal the blind is the one sent from God. He must be the Savior. He hears the voice of the shepherd. He believes and he falls down and he worships Him. When Jesus came again, He hears the voice of the Good Shepherd and He worships. Some of you hearing these words today need to obey the voice of the Shepherd. You want, it, you want the rest. You want the abundant life. It comes by entering through the door. It comes by listening to the voice of the Shepherd. And my prayer for you is that you would hear and you would obey and I'm praying that the Lord would bless you with the faith of the blind man so that you might run to the pool of the One who is sent, which is Jesus Christ. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, and come seeing that He is God, a very God. My prayer is that you would hear the voice of the Good Shepherd and obey. Let's pray together. Father, we come to a close this morning from our study of these opening verses and we are humbled. For You are the Good Shepherd. You are the door. You are the only way and the only hope. So my prayer, Father, is that Your, your voice would go out today, and that it would be heard, and that it would be obeyed, and that those who are lost sheep would come through the door into the fold and that they would find abundant life, that they would find peace, they would find pasture and go in and out under the care of the shepherd. But it is a work that only you can do. So may your voice go out loud and clear and may your sheep hear it today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.